Sure. I've always, yeah. you know, been asking so many questions to my dad, or we end up having discussions about it, just because I want to learn more instead of just, again, like Osman said, just blindly accepting, not just mm. it, in religious matters, but for everything, yeah. everything in life. Like you should have that curious nature to ask questions and ponder exactly why does mm. it have to be this way. That's Adila and Usman Omar talking about curiosity, culture, and an epic triathlon. Up next on the All Things Risk podcast. Welcome back, and we are back with another episode of the All Things Risk podcast. My name is Ben Catanio. I'm your host. This is my show where we go long form and use the lenses of risk and uncertainty to explore all types of fascinating topics. Before we get into it, a little bit of business. This episode is brought to you by Audible, the home for audiobooks. And as a listener to the All Things Risk podcast, you can get a 30-day free trial and an audiobook, which is yours to keep no matter what. To take advantage of this, simply go to audibletrial.com forward slash all things risk if you are in the USA or the link in the show notes if you are based here in the UK. All right, let's get into it. For the last few episodes, we've had these big picture conversations, which I love, frankly. However, as much as I enjoy them and as much as I try to frame them so that we can have something positive to do and to think about, I sometimes find it difficult not to conclude that When we talk about geopolitical risk, the divisiveness in the world, intolerance, closed-mindedness, all of those things, it's sometimes hard not to think at some level we're kind of screwed. Well, we're going to flip the script on all of that this week. Today's episode is one about adventure, sport, entrepreneurship, culture, and one that reminds us that the world is an amazing place, particularly when cultures collide, when we bring a sense of curiosity and wonder to our interactions and fold that into community and respect. My guests are Usman and Adila Omar. Usman and Adila are brother and sister. They are young entrepreneurs. They are from Pakistan, but live in the UK. And the projects they are working on embody this sense of connectedness across cultures and the wonderful things that can happen when that connectedness thrives. The first project is something called Try Pakistan, which I think must be the coolest and most beautiful triathlon in the world. It's taking place this summer on the 21st of July in the Karakoram region of Pakistan. If you check out the photos of the project, you will be stunned by the beauty of this part of the world. And we hear so very little about that particular region. And... The other project is something called Lemon Doves, which focus on handmade products from the local communities in Pakistan. And, you know, in speaking to Usman and Adila, I get the wonderful impression that, first of all, the kids are all right if these two are anything to go by. And secondly, I get a, a huge sense of positivity about the future and and the world and connecting with different cultures and making some wonderful things happen. We talk about all of that and we get into Usman and Adila's backgrounds growing up in Pakistan, what they think of life in the UK, Usman's cycling adventures and the upcoming his upcoming participation in the Silk Road Mountain Race, which is a 1700 kilometer and 26,000 meter climbing cycling race in Kyrgyzstan. We, of course, get into Tri Pakistan and Lemon Doves. We talk about risk-taking, adventure, and travel, and loads more. It's a fun conversation, so let's get right into it. Here are Usman and Adila Omar. Enjoy. Usman, Adila, welcome. Thank you to the All Things Risk podcast. Thank you. Thank you. It's Thank a you pleasure to us. have you both on. It's a, it's it's wonderful. I think that well, you are the first Pakistani guests I've had. Oh wow! So, Congratulations! First, <laughs> Congratulations! <laughs> <laughs> 
Before we uh, get into all of that, be very interesting to hear a little bit about who you both are and what you've uh, what you've done to hmm. get you know why are we standing why are we here, in, in, why are we here? Yeah. sat in front of one another so Usman maybe, maybe should I go first go okay. first so I'm Usman um, 26 years old I keep forgetting whether I'm 26 or 27 <laughs> it's very it's like that age um, and I'm the founder of Tri Pakistan. Uh, I've been doing a lot of cycling since I moved over to England in 2012. And, you know, I've just uh, found that um, taking every day as an adventure has been something, you know, I've, I've become really interested in. And I think forming a business out of that or, you know, just forming a life that I can support that, that you know, life of adventure. Is, okay. You know, I think I'm striving for. So, okay. So, you know, <coughs> a bit yeah. of interest, like... Um, it's it's an insight into my mind, I guess. Yeah. Okay, we'll yeah, get into yeah. all of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, um, my name's Adida, and I am twenty five. I just turned twenty five. <laughs> it's a very difficult question to answer. Like you know, whenever somebody asks yeah. you, "Who are you?" Hmm. But because um, I'm sort of still in that learning phase, I'm always learning. And um, I came to England in 2013 to do my university and I graduated in 2016. And then, you know, I always had that a very, I would say narrow minded now because I've come to realize, you know, where I was kind of heading towards and I sort of had like this whole plan mapped out. I'm going to go to university, I'll, you know, get a job and all of that. Um, so I did for two years. I was... Um, working in the corporate side of things, I would say. And I've been in the marketing sector for about two years. And um, I've come to a point where, you know, I've opened my mind up to exploring so many different ideas, so many different uh, ventures. Um, that now I've, you know, come on board with Osman for Tri Pakistan that we are establishing. And uh, on the side, I am... Um, I'm really taking my passion for art seriously as well. And I want to, you know, hopefully in the future mm -hmm. have exhibitions mm -hmm. and I want to set up my own venture, which we will obviously talk okay. about later. Yeah. yeah. So okay. that's kind of my so, um, background. Okay, great. Well, could you talk a little bit about what it was like growing up in Pakistan? What what was life like? Well, I child, I'll try, our childhood. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard for, we, I don't think I've got too many listeners uh, from Pakistan, so yeah. it might be a little bit difficult for them to picture that. So I think it'd be useful if you just talk okay. about what. Do you want to go first or should I, like? your experience? You should go first. Well, um, yeah, I think just, kind of, I was just thinking our childhood, I mean, we've had a really interesting childhood com like after coming to England and ha you know being able to compare between how our life has been mm -hmm. growing up um, and our dad was in the Pakistan Navy mm -hmm. so we sort of have a naval background and so did you move around a, a lot? yeah that's mm -hmm. what I was um, gonna come to yeah. that we kind of shifted between places especially from Karachi and Islamabad those mm -hmm. are the two you know the big cities or big hubs of Pakistan so we yeah we since an early age, I think that um, the explorative nature or the, you know, the excitement of traveling to different places, that kind of, you know, was nurtured within us. Mm. And so, and as like just looking at our parents as well, they're very, you know, adventure seeking as well. And they don't really go, they wouldn't go by the norms, kind yeah. of, they're weird in their own sense. <laughs> and so I think we kind of picked up on those weird um uh, personality traits um so yeah so um, but our childhood was um you know we've i don't know how to put it but i've had friends from there who have just grown up with and they've become family and you know even after coming to Eng england you always kind of look back at oh you still have got friends over there that you know even though your like distance is like miles away but every time you go back home, there's always that sense of family and a sense of community. Um, yeah, so um, I don't know if you want. I think I think touching back on the point we're moving. I think I've 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 really thought about that, and 
Um, and it goes back even a generation before uh, our parents. It goes back to our grandmother who was oh, yeah. English and mm-hmm. she moved to Pakistan. Okay. She migrated to Pakistan. She fell in love with our grandfather yeah. in England. And in the 50s, as a white woman, you know, moving to Pakistan, it was a really big, I think, um, just, a, just a big leap of faith uh, in someone, you know, you, Probably just met and mm-hmm. spent like a few months together, and then just moved there and marry that person and live that life with and him. Just completely move and countries. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's you know just um, us coming back to England or trying to find a way or our lives here. It's like coming back full circle, but yeah. that uh, sense of I think adventure is you know that it's that comes from us, yeah. some okay. for, from her. I guess I you, you have to be quite a. Uh, um, a, a, well, an, a, a, yeah. an unconventional household in yeah, in Pakistan, many ways. If, uh, if that yeah. you know, if you have, uh-huh. if that's the case, I don't, I don't know how many. Um, there is so so how many people I, have a have a background like that in in Pakistan. Not a lot, no, yeah, no, no, no. Mm-hmm. But um, because I think she lived um, the area where this sh- where she moved, she found other you know white women who'd. You know, English women who'd come over to Pakistan and married Pakistani guys, and so we've been in touch with some of them as well over the years, and now their kids and their kids. So, you yeah. know, we're all, you know, we keep in touch together. And I think also I was just, you know, thinking back um, on my childhood as well. I think that's also what kind of I, I wouldn't say like it made us st- stood apart from everybody else but some mm. like a lot of my friends suppose they were very into like Bollywood films or like Bollywood mm. music but we kind of we is just growing up with our granny in the house mm. I think we had that environment where we were a bit you know different from the rest of our peers in, in that sense we and our parents never encouraged us to you know uh, live that kind of traditional um, lifestyle or Pakistan yeah, lifestyle yeah, yeah. In, in that sense. So you gravitated towards English things or Western yeah, things? Yeah, or, or it just it was just something natural. Mm. We didn't really mm. think that, you know, it's something mm, weird about us, something different about us. It was just natural to, it, it was mm. something natural to us. So, yeah, it was, I think a granny would, yeah, or just having her there in the household was, was something special. A big special. influence, yeah. Yep. A big influence. Yeah. Mm. That's, yeah, that's super, <laughs> uh, that's super, <laughs> fascinating yeah Yeah. Yeah, so in in any ways I think we didn't have I think because even with within being the naval I think community you're you're very in a very you know it's essentially a bubble and you're not exposed to a lot of um, like everyday real life you know stuff as a kid I think because the naval community provides you with you know um sailing activities or swimming and things that a lot of people don't have access to in in normal life in Pakistan as a kid or only a few of you know the population has access to that and I think we were one privileged to have that and I think we we realized that and um, absolutely yeah yeah okay (laughs) okay what did you guys want to be when you (laughs) got older (laughs) You wanted to be an apple, right? <laughs> you, sorry, a what? An apple. It was an a apple. crazy okay. kid thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't know. I was, I think, imaginative like that. Just and thinking, then you go like, I want to be an apple yeah. every, every time. That's why I remember Ed, that, you know, like, yeah. that doesn't make sense, though. <laughs> but, um, so I, I don't think I ever um, really thought about that, what I want to be. I just was very, I, I still am very open-minded and kind of flexible and I want to, you know, um, explore different things. I don't, I want to be spontaneous and I want to take those risks hmm. to just really unravel what what lies ahead and what, what could be this possibility. So I never had one hmm. particular profession or a career in mind that I want to be this, I want to be that, but... I just wanted to, you know, take my artistic and a very creative nature and put that into whatever I want to achieve in life. Mm. 
It's funny, you didn't I, dream of being a I, naval I, officer. <laughs> uh, like no, I think, or, you know, our dad, dad never um, really pushed that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And never, really, he, he actually wanted us to explore our own, um, you know, interests and passions and try and do whatever the best we could. Not ex- not necessarily be the best, just our, our own best. And I, I think that's really, mm. you know, something a lot of Asian parents don't mm-hmm. do. Don't consider, but, yeah. Um, mm. Now it's a bit changing, but yeah, it's relative. Um, when I used to sail, like I, I remember, like um, you know, I, w- I wanted to be really good at it. I wanted to go, you know, to like some th- some of the Asian games that you know some of the older kids used to go to, but that never happened. Um, and then, like when I got into swimming, I was really good in swimming actually, and still, um, but you know, it like it has its troughs and highs, but. Um, but uh, growing up, I think I, I wanted to be part of a like uh, the Olympic team. That was one of my goals. But I, you know, as you as you grow older, you realize the reality of some things. You know, um, and and then that that dream just you know just changed into something else. You know, and and, mm-hmm. and different opportunities open up, and you take those opportunities more seriously um, because you realize you probably are more geared towards those things than you know being an Olympic swimmer and. If I'm not, that doesn't mean I'm I'm not good at something else. That's that's what I'm I guess, saying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what brought you guys to the UK? Education. Education. <laughs> yeah, personal, yeah. Yeah. Um, it was definitely yeah. The number one factor was education. Education, because we have an idea as to you know what sort of level of or the quality of education that you get back home. Um, but we again, like we were privileged enough to. Be ex- to be exposed to you know a public or a more naval school, and then going to a private school, which was sort of a transition to a better quality of education within Pakistan. Um, but then we knew that you know um, just that added factor of moving to a different country and just you know experiencing it and getting exposed to different a variety of people and a different culture all together so that kind of all you know blends in together it's Mm. not it is education but also being able to take that opportunity and um a step to doing something out Mm. of your comfort zone and just staying within in that country wouldn't have given us the opportunities that Mm. we've come across today for Mm. that matter so just a change of environment as well. And I think I was very, you know, a lot of like the people that I know, they've always been very, you know, they say they, I get homesick after moving to a different country and we miss our family, la la la. But I've, you know, if I've always been very positive about change all the time. So anything that changes, I take it with, you know, with um, optimism. I'm, I'm very positive about change so when I was moving to England I was very positive that, you know and very excited that I want to experience a, a different world altogether so, yeah. did you move here around the same time or a year later there was a year, 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 year gap okay. so I came in 2012 Adila moved in 2013 exactly, yeah. I think and um, for me it was again <laughs> I think there's a there's a part where you know having a British legacy in terms of being colonized as a nation um, you have that I think added um, you, you look up to I think you know that mentality has still not gone out of Pakistan mm. you know it's a very, yeah. it's, it's a very deep way of very saying deep. what I'm saying but <laughs> but um, I think there's an under underlying yeah. personally we probably not might not that. agree to it yeah mm. but, or but but, but subconsciously out, yes. that exists mm. I think as, in, a, as, in a, as a majority as a people. of the people yeah. yeah you know when you say oh oh you've been to a British university oh yeah, yeah they people just you know perceive say, you differently yeah, yeah it's like they, but I think that that's something that you know that's an underlying thing um but I think having that heritage or the ancestry of yeah, having that kind from of England, yeah attracted that, us that also more. and then but education was I think the factor yeah. that motivated us more than anything. Which did you both study? I studied psychology. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I studied communications and okay. sociology. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I t- do you, did you grow up in a religious? setting at all was religion up uh, well or? our parents have always encouraged us mm-hmm. to you know um always 
encouraged us and never really imposed anything on us mm-hmm. or forced us in in that sense. Um, and they've always been, you know, um, encouraging and supportive in that sense that we should be able to make our own choices and um, they're very open yeah. to that. Right I think I'd add to that, that and say that um, our dad has always been, you know, someone who has tried to make us think that uh, if you're doing something, you should know why you're doing not not just blindly follow it Following because it, yeah. everyone's doing it. So, um, you know, there's always that, I think, element of curiosity or finding out why something is the way it is. Yeah. yeah. But uh, but being in England, I think you get exposed to so many other religions and so many other people mm-hmm. and you just um, yeah. find so much more about uh, your own religion, I guess. Other people ask, you know, why do you do this? And mm-hmm. sometimes you don't even know the answer to that. And, and that's fine, but it, it just opens up how much you know about your own religion or not. Um, exactly. But I think our family has been really open about mm. things. Yeah, and like it's, I've it's always been... Yeah, I've always, yeah. you know, been asking so many questions to my dad or we end up having mm-hmm. discussions about it just because I want to learn more instead of just, again, like Osman said, just blindly accepting, not mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. It, in religious matters, but for everything, a- yeah. everything in life. Like you should have that curious nature to ask questions and ponder exactly why does mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. have to be this way. So, yeah. yeah. Was there anything that surprised you when you moved to the UK about the UK? Mm, you weren't surpri- well, prepared sur- for that thought yeah. that you, you you hadn't hadn't really considered took you took you back or I think universe at university no, but because <laughs> at university you're you have that um, sphere where a sphere of people from all over the world and they're they're all in that same boat, you know, who who am I? You know, do you, let's all be friends and yeah. let's learn from each other and that's very good and that's what a university is for and that's what I think I got from it, just knowing people from all over the world and different perspective again, mm. you know, moving from Pakistan and but what I think um set us or me would be like moving out of university, the whole work life, you know. Um I think your mind develops in a different way and progresses and out of university. Um, there's this transition and you start thinking about things more differently. And I think w- w- one particular thing I-, I wouldn't say, but it's just, ha- or I think it might be just the times that we are now, like Brexit and everything mm-hmm. and, you know, 2016, all the migration stuff. So it's just different how you perceive everything. Do you right? feel less yeah. comfortable here as a result of um, the current environment current. or mm. no. do we feel comfortable I would say or less, less, less comfortable. comfortable than perhaps when you moved here no I but I'm just talking about yeah, yeah, personally sure, like yeah. how I view this is I'm you know I don't tend to attach myself too much to whether it's politics or religious matters mm. or I don't tend to really, you know, stress myself or let those kind of external stresses affect yeah. me personally. So I would kind of like, you know, just step back and just look at it. How can instead of, I don't know, I don't really know how to put it, but being, I don't want to be part of the problem. I kind of want to take a step mm. back and just personally, what would, what what decisions can I make in my capabilities and my knowledge? How can I, you know, just work around these external factors? So I would try to. I I don't I don't perceive it as oh, oh you know Brexit is happening or any mm. other problem that are that we are currently experiencing. Yeah. Um, I would just work my way around that to counter those. I think. And, yeah. Sorry. No 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 yeah. go on. I think um, I don't. I don't feel less comfortable. It's yeah. just I think it's 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 people. Um, y- you like the media or the news tends to over exaggerate mm. everything, and mm. people generally are nice. And yeah. Yeah. you know, you it's like even in Pakistan, all the travels, even here, you know, people have generally been nice and. Uh, <laughs> 
I mean, it's I'm, I'm it's a bit like but, yeah. a reductionist way of saying that everybody mm-hmm. is nice. Yeah, there what might be, you know, negative aspects to yeah. to every person. I mean, even myself. Mm. But I think it's a matter of you know, kind of tackling and just. I, yeah, you're right. There's there's a, there's a nice side to every person. And I think yeah. if you're nice to them, they're nice mm-hmm. to you. I think that's that's what I'm trying to say. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I agree. Like not everyone can be nice yeah. as well. Like you need yeah. some bad people yeah. in the world as well. But yeah, just yeah, I'm just, I'm just curious because we do yeah. hear a lot of stuff in the media, and there are a lot of misperceptions and. Yeah, as you say, the everyone does have their uh, their great human mm. qualities, and similarly, we all have our have our faults. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, I'm just just curious if you've yeah, yeah if you, if you yeah, I was just thinking of the fact that you know you should just even if there are bad things, I think you should be accepting, still accept those flaws, and it's a part of life. Again, just you know, being on this podcast, thinking about risk taking. Yeah, it puts you mm. in a very, you know, in a very um, weak, I wouldn't, not not necessarily weak, but like a very unstable position. And so you kind of have to accept those obstacles or, mm. you know, just confront yeah. them. Mm-hmm. So, so again, even with people, mm. even if a person has negative traits, you kind of like accept yeah. and, or accept <coughs> the general... Um, negative aspects but kind of like face them and try to be a problem solver mm-hmm. in a way okay yeah rather than anything being a complainer like or being finding a, exactly yeah, mm-hmm. finding the solution to okay a lot of the time i think people just complain and overreact to a lot of the things <laughs> 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 that's a personal opinion <laughs> but anyways that's okay i'm drifting off topic <laughs> Oh no, we can go off topic. <laughs> off topic is fine, yeah. but uh, but I would like to start to talk a little bit about your project, Try Pakistan, and yeah. where what is it? Yeah, how did the idea come about? Okay, and we can probably Go dive into time. a few yeah. things. Yeah. So, what is it? It's essentially a triathlon. It's an adventure triathlon in the mountains of Pakistan. Mm-hmm. Simply, that's how that's how I think it is. Mm. Nothing more to it. Um, how did it come about? Um, I did uh, the London Triathlon in 2016. I I trained for like eight months, and then you know being there in person. I think that wasn't my first ever endurance event. Or uh, yeah, looking back to it, it's not even an endurance event. I but it's an Olympic. Oh, it is. It's yeah, a, it's a. It's a I think my so my I think my definitions yeah. have changed, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I think yeah, still still yeah, an mm-hmm. endurance yeah. event and. Um, just the sense of I think achievement at the end personally you, what you get out of it and the sense of camaraderie that you get from other people just participate because I think uh, you realize how equally important you know that event is to that person because they've put in that time you know just waking up early or going to bed at night late mm-hmm. meal prepping all that training you know is uh, is very emotionally draining mm. as well, and just finding other people that you, you can just see and you know un- mm-hmm. understand them intrinsically. Um, is, uh, that was something you know, you know I felt, and I thought you know Pakistan. I, uh, so people talk about the north and the mountains, and um, I just you know one day I was like. Google mapping all the stuff, and I was like, sure, I want to go there. There's some lakes over there. Um, it might be interesting having a, tri- have a triathlon there. And then I was at Escape the City in 2016, um, and I shared this idea with a friend of mine, and she was like, hey, yeah, this might be really good. Um, and she was back in Pakistan. Um, and then Johnny Miller from Escape the City. Maybe for listeners, if, oh, uh, what is yeah. Escape the City and... Uh, so escape what, the city what, what is did you, uh, why did why yeah. did you why did you why go did there? Do, okay, um, I think well, I was in a, in a really corporate job and I wanted to just uh, um, just upskill myself mm-hmm. and and I think try to learn more on how to start a business. Um, okay. But for for listeners, I think escape the city is a, it's a startup crash course where you learn. Um, sort of skills, skills and, yeah. and tools, sure. and the community around to build your sure. idea to sure. reality. I think in a uh, 
so I, I get did you did you want to do something beyond your mm. your corporate job is that is that yeah so, so I was working was the corporate job I was you still um, doing that uh, no, no so it's not okay. a corporate job anymore but <laughs> uh, it, it's in a startup environment but uh, corporate job uh, was training for the London triathlon found that sense of community you know how, that Escape the City was ending uh, in December in November end of December uh, starting December 2016 and I and the company was going through, a, a, I would say, some difficult times. And my job role was like mm. up in the air, and I wasn't really feeling that I was growing in that workplace. So I left the job, mm -hmm. and I and I took on my idea and I take that took that risk, I think, okay. and and just packed up everything in London and um, moved back to Pakistan and spent. I mean, I'll go into more details, but that's essentially how it happened. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, we talk a little bit yeah. about that because you 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 did say earlier like you, didn't you uh, cycle across the across southern England? Yeah. Or, so what, Cornwall. What yeah. Yeah. Twenty fourteen. I was at uh, university, mm -hmm. and I, <laughs> I just had this like wild idea that you know um, you know what if I could just cycle and I think the motivation was money. I think not having a lot of money makes you... But you want to see you, places, yeah. Yeah, we see okay. places um, yeah. and spend more time than just, you know, living in a hotel. Mm -hmm. or. Mm -hmm. and I think money was a motivator. Mm -hmm. um, then you start thinking more creatively when you have mm -hmm. little money. And So what did you do? Um, so I bought a bike for 60 pounds mm -hmm. of Gumtree. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it had like you know the guy was like really far off in Leicester. I just like went up in a bus and then I cycled back mm -hmm. uh, with the cycle. Mm -hmm. And it had a lock attached to it and um, cool. one of those like really s cheap locks. And he hadn't had he didn't have the key. So mm. all the time I was cycling in our corner, I had this lock. Yeah, this lock rattling around. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't have the key for it when he gave it to me. He was like, "Oh, if I find it, I'll let you know." I never found it. Mm. Um, so I bought that bike. Uh, I trained for a bit. I mean, uh, I just did like some 30Ks um, around, you know, Leicester. Like, th like just just basic gear, nothing, you know. I wasn't really into that whole, like, cycling mindset. You know how when you move to London or you start looking into things, like, yeah. cycling is so big and there's so many things to it. It's such a big culture to it. Um but yeah, essentially, I just bought the bike, did a the bike, bike, did a bit of trading. I started, you know, just experimenting with bags and just putting stuff in there. And yeah, I was really excited, and I started pieces. reading blogs about people who cycle the world and how they were doing it. And I just formed my own way of uh, this this small ride, and um, and I and I started in Bristol. And I went down all the way through Dartmoor, Ex Exmo um, Exeter, Exeter, Dartmoor, mm -hmm. and then down all the way to Land's End. Mm -hmm. And then back up on the west coast through St. Hives and, Could yeah. It must have been beautiful. Yeah, it's, yeah, those places are really, really mm -hmm. beautiful, like some of the roads. And, and it was August, so... Oh, there were other cyclists as well that you met on the way, right? At yeah, Cornwall, actually, yeah. yeah. There, was, there was other cyclists in... Near St. Ives, and this is like a German couple who were in their seventies, and they were just mm -hmm. you know cycling around. Mm -hmm. I think it was also that time when Bertha. I don't know if you remember Storm Bertha uh, mm. in 2016. That it literally a lot the of first day. And stuff, yeah. yeah, literally the first day that I landed in Bristol and I cycled, mm -hmm. <laughs> and halfway through the cycle, like the first day, um, like thunderstorms and showers, mm -hmm. and um, so I had to take the train to another place where I was couch surfing that mm -hmm. night. And that lady, and I going back to that point about you know finding nice people and um, the lady who I like the first time I ever couch surfed with, um, she was a doctor I think, and um, Margaret that's her name I remember <laughs> still, um, and she asked you know um, do, you, do you what what would you like for dinner and she picked me up from the train train station and like I was soaking wet <laughs> and um, she she offered me you know her place and for the night for free and nothing in return except wow. for a, a good conversa conversation yeah. and, mm. you know 
And she, like, like I was so stupid, but by the way, is that, you know, I, I went out without any maps. I didn't have a proper phone. I just, I was like, hey, Google Maps. I'll just, I had my laptop, by the way, as well. So oh, carrying. Why are you carrying your laptop? Because I, I didn't have a smartphone. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> so I was Resources. like, hey, uh, I'll carry my laptop. Um, and every day I'll just look up my route, you know, just write it down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think I forced myself to do that because... Um, that made me interact with people more because I fear... Yeah, you have to stop yeah. and ask directions. Am I going the right way? Yeah, so yes. that happened. I actually helped a guy out fix his bike because he was just like commuting um, and he had a tire puncture and I helped him and I asked him, I had a small conversation with him. So I think I forced myself to take that decision to not use smart ones. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Did you uh, did you know what you wh what you wanted to do? How long you had? Did you have okay. any ideas to stuff that you wanted to see, or you just kind of? Hmm. I, I because I did plan rode. it because I I uh, set up dates with the people who I was couch surfing with. Okay. Um, so I was in contact with them. Like, how um, did you do that? You, did you just uh, did you find these people beforehand? Is there so like I a couch surfing? I yeah, couchsurfing dot com. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, the, there's no expectation for anything, and people just open up How's their houses. How does that work? Like, people just want to. So you you create the, a profile, right? And um, and you, you say I'm doing this, and I'd like to exactly. Crash you just on your couch. you just so search, you know, in search in which city which people are uh, open to hosting. Mm -hmm. And you just message them, hey, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be that you're cycling or anything. Sure. It yeah. could be any any travel or any, you know, you want to do it cheaply. Hey, Ben, I'm coming to London yeah. today. You know, do you have a spare room? Yeah, that I, yeah. Because I've seen that because you, you want. And I think most people on Couchsurfing, uh, you know, love, love interacting like with interacting people. Interacting with people, yeah. different people. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's uh, what they like. That makes sense. Conversation, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah that's yeah. cool. So I planned that a month in advance, mm -hmm. actually, and I knew my cities that I wanted to go. Right. Um, and, you, and I had a friend, you were in, couch yeah, with and, and yeah. I had a friend who was living in near Penryn, to, so uh, I stayed with him for a few days. Um, yeah, it was mm -hmm. friends, and then I had a tent, so mm -hmm. where I didn't have a couch surfing mm -hmm. buddy or host, so just put my tent down mm -hmm. I was just wondering why didn't you choose like an Airbnb option would that have been uh, the cheap yeah, yeah free I was <laughs> trying to do everything for mm -hmm. for yeah. less money as possible and the corner space too, um, how much yeah. did you do you think you did the whole trip for if yeah, you had a well, uh, estimate. estimate yeah 400 yeah. pounds yeah that's pretty good for 10 yeah. days uh, 600 kilometers mm -hmm. yep mm. Um, but that doesn't include the uh, so all the tent and sleeping bag right. and everything. So, right. But that's another two hundred extra pounds, yeah. six hundred pounds. Yeah. But that's still, I think, very yeah, reasonable. Very, yeah, very, very reasonable for, yeah. A, yeah. for a holiday. <laughs> yeah. yeah, forty quid a day. For a holiday, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, I think that but was. Do, do, have yeah. you ever done anything like that? Um, so I'm just thinking about yeah. my travel experiences because I've been, you know, I love traveling. Um, so I have, I mean, I'm not, I used to be very athletic and sporty at school, but then kind of after coming to England, <laughs> I've not really been to, uh, been into sports. Um, but I, you know, developed that sense of traveling. So I remember traveling um, just by myself, just, you know, in 2016, I think it was 2016, um, to Europe. And I just decided to get my, one suit, just grab a small suitcase and just go on, you know, go to different cities that I had mapped out and just meet strangers. And that's why I was asking him about Airbnb as well, because I didn't think about couch surfing. That would have mm -hmm. been much cheaper. <laughs> mm. But um, so, yeah, I just, you know, took that step of um, saving up a lot of money from my, you know, the job that I was working uh, full time at and just taking that step of, just going all by myself, not knowing anybody in different countries. And even with air, staying at different Airbnbs, I think there's always that sense of um, reluctance that, you mm -hmm. know, or you don't know that person, how trustworthy they are and what kind of um, place that would be. But mm -hmm. I did, you know, I did a very rigorous research as to what would be the ideal location in a city where to stay mm -hmm. at. And um, 
So I traveled to, I started with Barcelona in Spain and then I went on to France, Germany, Austria and I think I ended back in Spain as well. Um, but I did have, I mean, I encountered a bad um, <laughs> bad experience in Paris and it was unfortunate that, you know, where I had rented that Airbnb was a very... I don't know how to put it. How would you describe it best? A very um, shady. Shady <laughs> part of town. A very shady part of town. And I had arrived in Paris at about midnight. So it was very late. Mm. And um, I caught the... I wasn't really aware that, you know, how far this place would be. Mm. So it was in the suburbs of Paris. Mm. It wasn't really right in the city center. And it was 30 minutes by train so I thought you know I commute every day more than 30 mm. minutes so 30 minutes isn't too bad just going back and uh, forth within th to the city center so I went to the part of the, uh, a suburb in in Paris and I caught the last train and I as I was exiting the train station they were closing the train station because you know that was the last train and so the guards kind of warned me of just carry I was probably the uh, yeah I was the only person there but I could see, you know, a lot of other um, other people around, which did not look really um, safe. Safe. <laughs> <laughs> and so the guards even warned me that, you know, it's not really safe to go around this area because there have been, you know, incidents where tourists have come and they've not really experienced. Um, they've yeah encountered. They've not had a good time. Yeah, <laughs> not had a Plus. good time at all. <laughs> yeah. So. So I was alone, you know, mm. and um, now these guards have warned me as well. So I just decided to take an Uber to the place. And uh, even the Uber driver is, you know, kind of like a bit wary as to what am I doing here mm. at this time of the night and how did I even like mm. end up here? And then he, we drive down to the Airbnb and the Airbnb is, com is not exactly what it was illustrated as, 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 mm. as advertised. Um, and now I'm in two minds, do you, you know, do I still carry on? Um, but, you know, it, my gut feeling was that it's better to, you know, I, I can feel that something's off about this mm -hmm. place. And so, you know, I let the Uber driver <laughs> take me to the city center and he advised that as well. And, um, and then I ended yeah, up staying at I think it's interesting. Out. We have... Uh, kind of fear receptors in our, you know, in our, mm. in our brains, or you know, we're kind of hardwired most mm. of the time when we're doing, we're at work, or when we're on social media, whatever. Those things kick in, and actually, we shouldn't really be listening to them, but because mm. we're, we're always scanning for threats, uh, and yeah. sometimes it's just, it just, we're just looking for something that that really isn't there. That's just the way that we're hardwired. Yeah. But in those situations, when you're traveling. It's, it's probably a good idea to, yeah. to listen to those um, the, those those little threat yeah, threat cause sensors. I, exactly, because I think there um, there are two. Well, I mean, this is my opinion on it. I, I feel like there are two kinds of threats or risks that you can take. One would be sort of you know like a minor, not a, really a minor, but risks or certain threats that you can um, that you can accept or you kind of can you know, um, face them. But then there are those kind of risks which would completely eliminate you, mm -hmm. sort of. They'll just ruin you. So, so you know, mm. you, you can, you yeah, can differentiate you to, between the <clears throat> yeah, kind of risks. Yeah, you have to know, like, if, if this goes horribly wrong, mm -hmm. worst, yeah. you know, worst, worst case, uh, would I survive? And sometimes it, you, exactly. if you don't know that, yeah. the answer to that yeah. question, then it's probably a good idea yeah, to not, should, not tempt fate. Exactly. Yeah. And so you should always kind of, like, you know... Um, listen to your gut as well just use your in instinct and that intuition that you know if something's off then yeah. you kind of just move yeah, away from it certainly in a travel so, situation it makes yeah. sense yeah so I, I stay I ended up staying at a hotel which really costed me <laughs> sure but <laughs> but that was you know could have cost you more if you yeah. didn't exactly so. so I ended up staying at that hotel for that one night but mm -hmm. then you know next morning I was up mm -hmm. looking for Airbnb because yeah. I knew what my budget was and kind okay. of like had to work around it so I, uh, fortunately I got in touch with this lady who was renting out the Airbnb and her name was Lydia and she was the most <laughs> exceptional person that mm -hmm. I came across throughout my trip because the way she welcomed me and 
the way you know she showed me around Paris as well and I got to you know exchange contact mm-hmm. with her and have a good time with her just mm-hmm. so so you know you kind of like divert mm-hmm. yourself from a bad situation yeah. but then you encounter right uh, so that's that's really interesting um, let's maybe flip the script a little bit now so <laughs> yeah. you've set this thing up called try Pakistan yeah. uh, and then who who are your ideal you know clients for customers for this would it yeah. be people in the West that you want to show something about Pakistan D- absolutely that- I mean we I, I always say that you know we're yeah. welcoming anybody yeah. so right. obviously the point of the whole triathlon is that you know you it's it's an uh, it's, it's a very an adventure a strenuous yeah. and activity being part of a triathlon um, so obviously we're targeting athletes and people who are just passionate about sports mm-hmm. and want to do outdoor activities and just thinking about, you know, the market here, people who, that are small and probably knows a lot more athletes within, like, um, in London. And so people from the West, obviously, inter- a lot of international people, but the whole idea is to, you know, give Pakistan more credit as well mm-hmm. and exposure because it's a beautiful country to visit and it's like it's just I saw the uh, I saw you know, the, the photos look spectacular yeah. you know, the mountains I mean, and the, the lake of where uh, where you maybe happy. you can talk a little bit about that about uh, the, yeah about the I, area. I actually visited in, in 2017 was it so yeah, yeah 2017 yeah. so I all of these guys like my parents and Osman and uh, our younger brother he they they all had gone to these northern areas and I had just seen their pictures and I was just you know very uh, enthusiastic to go on uh, on a trip as well so I think in 2017 we went to um, these areas in um, in the northern mountains and um, I remember that I think the most challenging thing that I would have done ever in my life <laughs> was oh yeah. <laughs> was um, we went to this mount- this particular mountain range and we were trying to um, cross a mountain cross pass. A, 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 a pass. A pass, yeah, yeah. yeah, it was a, a mountain pass. And it was at an altitude of more, more 5, than 5,800, 5, yeah. Me- 4,800 meters. Meters, yeah. It's pretty high. So <laughs> that was, yeah, mm-hmm. that was the highest that I have, you know, physically mm-hmm. um, gone to. Yeah, we didn't get there, though. So, so we went on a three-day trek um, adventure and um, we started off with you know just going sl- trekking slowly by slowly covering short dis- distances and you know taking short breaks but then we eventually um, the second the second day, day yeah. we reached the foot of the hill and that day we had to cross the the pass I mean we did throughout this you know two day two days we did encounter a few problems like um, one of our um, backpacker she ended up, you know, breaking her shoes. shoes. So that was mm. kind of the a struggle. Yeah, the sole just came off. So, and then um, everybody, I was very inexperienced. I had never done anything like this. Another person hadn't done anything like this. So we were kind of like all struggling and like panting for our lives. Um, and then we were at the foot of the hill on the second day and we decided to climb up. But then the back pa- the experienced porters that were with us they kind of like you know they went up the f- the tiller summit and we could literally see them as tiny dots on on this big mountain and they're at the summit and they were kind of checking if the condition was okay because it was snowing at that time um they were just checking if it was okay for us to you know be able to pass um cross over um they came back down and just because I couldn't, I was in a very, um, I was actually okay at that time, but everybody else was kind of, you know, there was a panic in that, <laughs> in that moment because everybody had, was, you know, out of energy. And so we were unable to, you know, we decided not to cross over and to cover our distance back all the way back. Um, but on the way back, that was when I kind of, um, <laughs> almost felt un- unconscious because what? the altitude yes. where we, 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 we I think we yeah. went to, oxygen, yeah we yeah. went around another route a, okay. a slightly higher okay. kind of region and so I'm 
I'm, you know, in my mind, I'm still telling myself I can do mm-hmm. it, and the voice in my head is telling me, like, you know, push through it, push mm-hmm. through it. You, you can, you know, you can just do it. It's a bit more distance, and then you'll be on the lower <coughs> um, altitude. But obviously, my body was a bit uh, was giving up on me, and um, it was it was very difficult wow. for me to breathe. Wow, and. And but yeah, you know, Osman, think, uh, Osman yeah. was really there, you, you know, just giving me that, um, like you boost. were giving me, chocolates, yeah, like you were giving me chocolates and, and a bit of glucose to just you. to get that mm-hmm. energy going. Um, and he was really talking, you know, pushing me through it, and I kind of was, I was affirming and you know. T- just assuring myself that you know I'll I will make it through and I would not die on the. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was I was really concerned because uh, uh, thing is I, I I'd been on that pass before previously uh, and uh, and um, going with someone I think I think that was my you know um, I think I, you know I hadn't realized that you know um, being. So any experience, you know, I I think it was challenging enough. I think just to even to get there, I feel. Um, but again, going back to that point, you know, where your receptors like go, this is like the you know you have to turn back or do something to save yourself at least. Um, and Adila had literally just from being normal to <laughs> literally just you know yeah. the energy just fading yeah. away that you know you can't walk and in that situation where you're like two days away from the main road from and and this plateau is like four thousand five hundred meters high and no communication with anyone and it, you just you know um think think other things and yeah. but but i think uh more than anything uh, i think i just was I like, would just need to get down this hill and mm. you know just uh, that'd be fine and and just rest and mm. stop and camp and eat yeah food, exactly food. I, th- I think and that was our solution but mm. yeah the, so this uh, yeah, so that this okay. this uh, Tri- tripakistan yeah. is yeah. in that s- same sort of area so, so it's pretty so high the, elevation the elevation yeah. is. Yeah. 2600 meters so which not, yeah not quite not quite 4500 yeah, yeah. yeah. though yeah, I think lower, because that's yeah. that's too extreme mm-hmm. but um, there's possibility of even doing that mm-hmm. over there um, but 2600 meters is like ch- I, I feel it's challenging enough to you know even for the experience but it's it's a good it's a good place to uh, start off as well um, so the the region is Kilgut Baltistan and um, it's it's a uh, it's between China and like the mainland Pakistan area. So you know it's it's essentially the corridor between China and Pakistan and all that investment from recent work with you know China. <coughs> that place has boomed with tourism and I think um, uh, you know it's got so many lovely places that it needs to be um, protected as well. Um, and there's a lot of domestic tourism now that you know might affect mm-hmm. certain things. Um, but I think uh, even the goal with Tripakistan is just to involve the community, the local community at the location um, as much as possible, uh, and I think educate them in ways where okay. you know um, I think bringing expertise expertise from in England, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and or other parts of the world where people have had yeah. sustainable tourism what, and what have yeah, you yeah. Uh, what have you found so far uh because uh it's the first yeah. triathlon in that in that area yeah. so yeah. what have you what have you learned so far about you know about mm. pulling something like that together to the the local yeah. people you know they, they i do they now understand what, what mm-hmm. you're trying to do mm-hmm. or what, what challenges have you have you faced in pulling this together yeah um some of the challenges I think were like more like local people over there don't really know what a triathlon right. is. So right. I think it's it's fairly you know obvious yeah. and um, um, so it was uh, like the people that were mm-hmm. incorporating with us to, to, at this at this event um, the community were, were explaining to them what this mm-hmm. event is mm-hmm. you know because obviously mm-hmm. they have these questions which are. You know, they've never come across it, but mm-hmm. um, they're very open to having something like this uh, in their area, and it boosts, you know, businesses mm-hmm. for them, uh, puts, you know, uh, 
spotlight on them for mm-hmm. a certain period um and coincidentally there's a lake um below so this this lake that we have the uh, Borith lake it's nestled between two glaciers mm. um wow and uh so it's it's like there's two rocky outcrops and then mm. in the center there's a depression and um there's it's essentially a bowl um so you'll be swimming in the lake and then running around and cycling around in this a bowl which is a playground mm. mm-hmm. <laughs> and there's two glaciers and in one of uh, at the bottom of one of the glaciers there's a lake um uh, that's i think not swimmable because it's too cold and in the winters when it's too cold it turns to ice and mm. people go there to ice skate like mm. l- l- ice skate and it's uh, there's there's a few like local ice skaters and you know really? the, the kids come there and play and it's it's just fun kid, yeah. and i think um there there's uh there's there's opportunities to develop that but i feel you know doing it in a sustainable way is like the best for, way forward yeah, you, yeah. you've one of your values yeah. uh, is in environment yeah uh, can you talk a little bit about how to mm. make this uh, sustainable yeah venture yeah sure i think um where i'm really focused on i think having less of the the least impact i can have on the environment in terms of my organization of the event so um using the most recycled products i can get hold of or using food that you know in a sustainable manner that uh, you know is not wasted but i think environment uh, comes down to more um about the i there's there's an interact like interlinkage between the people and the environment because they both benefit off from each other so just educating them about um how how their environment is so important to them around um this area because there there's been a lot of deforestation so i think in the future you know we're trying to see ways of how we can impact that mm-hmm. so there's there's still loads to do mm-hmm. um and there's still loads to experiment i think yeah yeah so this is the 31st of tw- sorry yeah 21st, 21st sorry yeah. yeah that's fine and uh so what what are people going to experience when mm. they get there what, okay so if if i walk you through it yeah, i guess <clears throat> so you'll essentially be arriving in Gilgit Airport, and we'll pick you up, and we'll drive you to the location. We'll we'll get there. I think um, it's it's a lot about community bonding, and uh, you know, as going back to that experience of being in the environment of a uh, of a challenge or the event. Um, going back to the London Triathlon, I think I want to recapture or bring that element to a very core. Mm-hmm. Uh, number of people that you know enjoy doing this activity and going and exploring pe- things. So I think there's a lot of mixture of like food, uh, how people make their food, the local food, the local music, the culture. I think the homeliness mm-hmm. of everything. Um, there's a local village over there as well. So I think interacting with those people um, and just learning how they live their lives is I think integral to making it a very unique experience. Um, so that's something you know um i think that could differentiate it from very traditional triathlons uh, i don't want it to be a traditional mm-hmm. triathlon and that's the that's the objective mm-hmm. yeah it's a three day oh yeah triathlon well the, the, the triathlon is on just one day but it's a three like three a weekend yeah. experience yeah. yeah so yeah and we are also thinking to hopefully have um some motivational speakers yeah. or a guest oh, cool. after mm-hmm the triathlon so um i think we would want to have like an ice breaking activity prior to the triathlon just so that everybody mingles with each other and so we have the triathlon and post triathlon Mm -hmm. have a little bonfire night um and and tell share stories Mm -hmm. and so i think that would you know um get that sense of community going sounds great Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah what are some of the things that um, so, so in terms of setting setting this up? I, I, I presume you've got one of the challenges. I I, I can perhaps think yeah. of, and I'm just yeah. curious how you've uh, uh, I, how you've dealt with it is uh, just just getting uh, you know support crew around. You've mm-hmm. got people that don't that in the area maybe they don't know what a triathlon is, but then you you need some support crew whether it's a 
yeah. people on the lake or uh, yeah. along the course or feed like stations marshals or, yeah. or marshals, yeah. 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 timing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've got timing mats or if you're not yeah. going to even do those I kinds think of things. <coughs> that's a very interesting question. I was had a conversation with some someone earlier, and I uh, I think that I have to find a balance between that. Yeah. So yeah. you know, if it's not a very unique or a traditional tri sorry traditional triathlon, <laughs> yeah. yeah, then um, uh, there has to be a balance between uh, just to make sure that uh, everything's safe enough. Yep. Um, so you have those people in place yep. in, yep. in places that are needed and you have those feed stations where it's needed yep. but not go overboard sure. just to uh, maintain the sanctity of this I think yeah um, I mean I, it doesn't sound to uh, me like a place where you want people that are no. like I'm going to set the course record and I'm exactly. going to get a podium no, place no, and no, you know, this no. sort of thing so it's not that yeah. Yeah. yeah it's more about the whole I think it's an experience, experience. Yeah. yeah so um that's uh, that there's a fine balance between both mm -hmm. things but uh, going back to the community aspect of things there's a lot of kids um who I saw over there that you know want to swim in the mm. are swimming were swimming mm -hmm. in the lake when I went there and um are just uh so I I saw I, I I've already told you the story but I think I don't know if you remember but um I saw one guy you know from that village who gone on to this main one of the main cities he was a university swimmer mm -hmm. and he'd come back and he was just right. swimming over there and some of the local kids i feel were inspired by mm -hmm. him so you know there's a way out for mm -hmm. them and it's just an inspiration and i think if you can, if i can impact um um the kids more than anything um through sport that's mm -hmm. that's i think a worthy objective and goal um, and so having that, their involvement as, you know, marshals or volunteers mm -hmm. on that day is, is I think, key. And, um, get, like, just from personal experience and just being in Pakistan, there's no, like, there's no dearth of, you know, um, people wanting to do this stuff. Like you give them opportunities, they'll just mm -hmm. run up to you and they'll be like, yes, I want to do this. Yeah. And there's a lot of energy and... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like people that. will ex like just yeah give up their time for you um, mm -hmm. without I feel anything in return, yeah. really. But mm -hmm. but in that region, yeah. particularly yeah, as well, region, yeah. I think people mm -hmm. have a very different nature and a different attitude yeah. towards, and mm -hmm. they're very welcoming and open to mm -hmm. different experiences. Experiences, so yeah. Yeah, for them, it's like That's you know, uh, like someone having a local event and them mm -hmm. supporting it. So. Yeah. Um, so we've got uh, a local hotel where uh, I would call, I mean, people call it a hotel and, but, but yeah. the thing is, uh, yeah, it's an accommodation, um, but it's, it's really good. And, uh, it's run by these local two brothers, um, from that same village. Mm -hmm. And, um, we've partnered up with them, partnered up with them to give us the accommodation for the whole weekend. So, cool. um, we have that connection and they, they can, you know, uh, easily bring all those people in. Well, uh, yeah, so literally it's 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 that. You, yeah. you, you turn up to a village, yeah, you yeah. say, cool. hey, do you want to help us do this? And yeah. they're like, yeah. Um, and they actually do it. It's not yeah, that, yeah, you know, yeah. this is a hollow yeah. way of, yeah. What, uh, do you have any expectations for what what's yeah. going to happen beyond that or some, anything that you'd like it to mm. turn into or, or are you just going to... Just kind of see how it goes on um, uh, in, in July. I think a bit of expectation, but mm -hmm. I don't have too high expectation. Mm -hmm. I think just learning from previous ex right. previous years. Um, I think I'll take and I've realized over the years this is not something that will happen. You know, just be really big overnight. I don't want it to be really mm -hmm. big overnight. I want it to be like I I gain uh, a lot of experience by myself organizing it with other people mm -hmm. and. Um, also finding that you know balance between how we impact lives um, and also provide this great experience mm -hmm. um, I think going down there might be like there, there's so many other places that I think if I if I can replicate a model make a model off of it so it's worth replicating in other places and um, yeah, yeah they're, they're probably quite a few places around the world yeah, where there are like the world, these remote really. places where actually it's a great place to have say yeah. a triathlon um and you just need to see how we can yeah you know, how, how can you build the, mm. the kind of the, the basic infrastructure exactly. around it yeah um if you could replicate that that'd be very yeah. that'd be very cool i think yeah. there'd be a lot of uh, a lot of people that 
you could even develop a kind of a world community. Right? Yeah. yeah. Sort of, could I exactly. create a triathlon in my in, in my neighborhood and um, invite sure. people from around the world? And would yeah. they be interested in it? And, you know, that, yeah. um, that might be something that um, that you could do yeah. off, so, of the, yeah. off the back of that. Yep. But it's, I think, in keeping that in mind, uh, I do have to take all the small steps first. Too. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, so this is one small step. It's an step. experiment. Yeah, right? it's an so experiment. It's exactly. Experiment it's and uncertainty. Risk every yeah. day. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you limit the, the, the downside and then there's, there's, loads of, there's loads of upside. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Connecting people around the world yeah. uh, who have the same type yeah. of thing. And you probably, you won't necessarily know who's going to really be interested in this until mm. you actually put it out there and, uh, really. see who comes and what they Definitely. say and after you do that then you can you know you can take it uh, yeah you know step. i've actually had a lot of interest from pakistanis um um living in mm. america and mm. some in germany some in mm. oman and some malaysians have contacted me um mm. and so there's there's definitely you know uh mm-hmm. Need, the it, word uh, w- yeah. something yeah. interesting yeah, yeah it's not it's not just it. about you know i think the fact is like the reason why we're i think um first of all based in london is we have access to uh, you know people with a lot of knowledge and experience and something that we mm-hmm. can learn from second it's like it's like a hub where you can connect with people from around the world mm-hmm. and and uh, I think just focusing early on with people in London, I, I, that's not the end goal, but it's like, yeah. you know, Starting, just yeah. where yeah, we so have the access at the moment. And we have access to Pakistan, we have access to London. Sure. So yeah, bringing those, those things, things together. together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I see a lot of potential there. I, yeah. Um, I, I don't know how it's, uh, how, how it'll pan out, but, but uh, I'm sure it'll be fantastic. It sounds yeah. like a great venture and a great idea i think yeah. that there are people who starting out um in you know endurance either they're starting out or they're they're not you know they, they don't want to do a big long hmm. um ultra triathlon or uh, yeah. uh, ultra event um, and then on the other hand though there are some people that are kind of in that ultra space that i find fascinating because they're they're actually more laid back and they're into adventure hmm. uh, and i think that you know they there's also the the you know the highest triathlon i think there yeah. the people would be like ooh i better do i better do that but or i'd like to try that out so yeah. it's, it, it's hard to it's hard to tell it's, fully it's, but then there's a core yeah. bunch of triathletes that i don't think are your no, because they, no. they're just too interested in times and the fastest the yeah, 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 yeah exactly yeah. exactly uh, that's true it's a very but, the, but there's a probably yeah. very powerful community of people that like they, they have mm-hmm. yeah, yeah the, the, there's where there's a bit of overlap of yeah you know travel adventure endurance Absolutely, you know all that yeah. kind of stuff yeah yeah that's that's really been something you know i've i've um it's been really um fascinating to figure that out over the past few years and uh there's Exactly. There's there's traditional triathlete. I mean, I wouldn't call them traditional, but triathletes who just go after their personal best, um, or stick to more traditional triathlons uh, or Ironmans. Um, and it's it's figuring out how how where where do I fit in in this yeah. whole market? Yeah. Um, there's the Xterra uh, triathlon series, which is more uh, like all off road triathlons, but uh, I think it lacks that sense of community. So. And that experience, um, everyone I think does have a unique experience yeah. in their triathlons. I'm not yeah. saying you know their traditional triathlon doesn't mean anything to anyone because yeah. yeah. it means something to them as uh, they've. I'm sure there's like yeah. a whole host of people so, that. Uh, but that I, I feel there's there's um, definitely you know room for this as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's a very it's a very interesting uh, project, and uh, yeah. I'm fascinated with how it, how oh, it's go. It looks like it's in a beautiful part of the world. So yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Very. Uh, yeah. Uh, to ma- like the photos and the videos and the yeah. look absolutely amazing. Thanks. So, Thank you. <laughs> you've, you've talked about, or we talked a little bit earlier about some other projects that hmm. you that oh, you yeah. were yeah um, looking at doing. So I'd be curious to be, hear what those yes. are. Yes. Do you want to go? Yeah. Go on. Um, so I think it, it the why we were saying it kind of ties into um, the project that we're working on is because it stems from Pakistan as well. And um, just to simply put it, we want to set up an online boutique to source, like ethically source, Mm -hmm. all these artistic products um, from different underprivileged regions of Pakistan. 
And why I say underprivileged regions is because I've personally visited all these different remote areas of Pakistan, especially in Sindh. And um, they are they're basically living in a very um, they're living below poverty line and it's just a very underprivileged mm-hmm. um, community that they have and the work that they're creating doesn't get that much exposure and so they aren't really you know exposed to better opportunities and so through this um, on setting up this online boutique we want to give especially women in those regions um, the, that opportunity mm-hmm. to market and sell their products which they handcraft and which takes about them it could take from 15 days to over any uh, over a year so there's a variety of products that we would want to uh, introduce but initially where um there's a very particular pro- uh, a product that they create it's a, a very intricate pattern designed um blanket or a quilt or you could say a, du- a duvet which we use here um so these women in these different regions of Pakistan, they take, they you know take recycled cloths and they stitch everything together and just have this preconceived design in their in their minds and they just you know pour it out all on this sheet on a fabric, mm-hmm. and it might not be a canvas because you know we're very used to a traditional piece of art which is you know painting on canvas that would be considered as art, but I think it's their way of expressing art and what's really in their mind and expressing their creative side with um, just, you know, this piece of fabric. So they're very integrate designs and that's why a lot of the time, like what I experienced over there is that people, you know, come and collect the, um, they buy these products from different parts of Pakistan but the the you know the artisans who are creating these they are not given their worth of or the value of their mm-hmm. work and so you know i really want to introduce it to a wider market mm-hmm. and especially in in um you know just having access to just starting off in mm-hmm. london um you know hopefully people would admire and appreciate the amount of hours that really go into this piece of mm-hmm. uh, work and just the amount of effort as well that goes uh, into yeah. this, yeah. So um, the project, obviously, is the name, the name yes. of the the project is Lemon Doves, and okay. you know it'll stay in your head now. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason why we've come up with yeah. Lemon Doves is um, lemon is the color yellow, and yellow the color. Yeah, I'm very into color theories, so. So yellow represents that intellect and artistry um, and dove is a symbol of peace. Mm -hmm. So I want to, you know, interlink, connect Mm. these two together and it's unity or peace through art and through artistry. Um, And that's why Lemon Doves came about. So, yeah. Really cool. (laughs) Yeah, I think, uh, you know, both projects like Fire Pakistan and Lemon Doves, I think we... I think the core between the two is like um, involving local people or the people who actually deserve um, mm-hmm. some importance and value. Um, mm-hmm. You know, that's I think that's what is connecting both of them, mm-hmm. and that's why I'm involved with that as well. And Adila is involved it seems with Kabaksan. Well. That you're also connecting cultures through Absolutely. those yeah. Yeah. things, yeah. Yeah. and that the, that. Both of those mm. projects, in some ways, are a bit of a microcosm of your of, of your and life and yeah. the values that you've, <laughs> yeah. you've taken to uh, yeah, connect right, people yeah. to um, you know True. different parts of, of your own yeah. your own identities and that you know, making those connections obviously is a, a powerful yeah. thing and a good you know mm. a, a, a good thing for, for you know a way of opening up people's minds, minds and connections yeah. to other parts of the world. Which is really fabulous. I was actually talking to someone about Lemon Elves yesterday um, at a bar, and um, she was she was a charity. She works for a charity, and she goes and does the projects around the world. And, mm. um, she was really interested with how I think um, telling the stories of the people who actually make it yeah. is you know very effective. Um, and I think that's that's what we've had since the beginning. Um, so Adila went out in November, and she found these women 
in the villages and met them and yeah. you know really spoke, spoke to, to them, them and personally on a, on, a, on a very personal level and, and they're very yeah. um, you know they have that se- they have a, pa- a sense of passion in them mm. they're passionate about creating these and you know being able to express themselves through this through different p- uh, work of art mm. so the trunks talk about the trunks you know they, they don't oh yeah, have, they, yeah. They, yeah they've, they're so passionate I mean that's a level of exactly, passion yeah. and of their work that they've got trunks and trunks full of loaded with all these you know uh, different designs and different art artworks I would say um, and they're so you know they value their work so much that if I would be like you know, um, can I have this one? But they would mm-hmm. have in their mind that no, this particular one is for for this person or for this for my son that I would or my daughters that I would give it to them when they get married. So it's, it's a, a tradition tied to these um, release. Okay. The products are called release, okay. and so each release itself has a value for them, and so that's why they you know they w- want to create more and more new um, pieces so that they can each tie mm. their own piece and sp- spread it mm. to you know and sounds um, sounds amazing yeah yeah that sounds like a, a wonderful so it's precious it's really i precious. think what really from that uh, you were telling me because they the the, the, the women you, that you visited they they live in mud houses right and mm. um um they and their rooms are just the, there's yeah. nothing bare bare it's it's literally for sleeping or Absolutely, eating yeah. and and but but in that bare room they have this like trunk which is mm. filled with valuable pieces of right. uh, you know yeah. quote, that they stitch with there's their some hands. Wealth, there's some wealth that they exactly. yeah so they share with exactly the world and and, and mm. yeah that's that's what they share. Mm. As, mm-hmm. yeah. That's their valuable possessions in mm. instead yeah. of having you know they, mm. they barely have anything in that in in that house. But, mm. There'll just be that trunk and just one. Um, sort of place to sleep, and that's that's it. Mm. So it's very eye opening as well. Do you know? That I'm I'm a big believer in the the power <coughs> of people connecting to one another. So I don't know how you're pulling this <coughs> project together, but just like, and I'm just thinking about your experience with couch surfing and you know connecting with someone you didn't know. Mm. Like, for me, the power of the, the kindness of strangers. Yeah is is amazing and yeah. one of the things that you know kind of keeps the the world really moving in a, in the right the right mm. kind of direction but if you can create the some stories behind the people that are producing you know, th- yeah. these things mm. uh then i think that i think that's extremely yeah. powerful mm. and and people and and interesting people would be you know where, where did this thing come from and yeah. um who made it mm. and that, that that's 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 yeah. all quite quite yeah, fascinating so I, really. I don't i don't know how to unlock that in terms of a you know a huge uh, a huge venture but uh yeah, no but there's there's definitely something there and i i really find very powerful your the the way the way in which you've connected the different aspects of of your your lives to these these ventures it's that's quite it's, it's really it's quite good cool. to hear a different perspective as well yeah. because we weren't able to probably see it from that your, angle yeah from, connecting from it from our childhood yeah. i think yeah well, I think there's something <laughs> happening about um, authenticity in the world, where uh, the those that are you know are able to uh, connect with themselves and with with each other in a more sort of authentic way, that lends itself to for, certainly from a business perspective, trust between you know the the customer and and whatever it is mm-hmm. that you're that you're trying to do, yeah. um, and it's a countervailing force I find to the kind of mass produced stuff that. Mm. This, you know that, that's uh, that's getting you know th- th- that gets produced around the world so there's something there there's a wave mm. going in the opposite direction to where we think everything else is going mm. I, don't, I, I can't I'm, I'm just this is stuff I've just been thinking about yeah. recently and I, yes. I don't know how to better harness it or how how to better uh, un- understand it but there's definitely something there and if we you know can Grab, grab, grasp on, understand it, yeah. it, grasp the concept a, a bit better. Then I think there'll be some some really exciting things mm. happening about the, about the world and a great way of managing some of the big risks think, that we have in the world. I mean, could you could you have a middle ground between mass produced um, and and sustainable goods? And I think that'd be the best solution mm. ever. But um, 
that will you know um, <laughs> one of the things that I've you know been really think, thinking about recently as well as about the the consciousness mm-hmm. of what we're really investing in or what we're mm-hmm. buying and with lemon doves I think what I really want people to or would want to encourage is that conscious consumerism that mm. you know really understand why you're why why would you want to buy this product mm-hmm. so again it ties into the background of a woman who is creating that who is um a master in her craft mm. and so really be conscious and aware of you know where this again what you said where the source where this product mm. is coming from why do you need it why would you want to invest in it so a lot of the times that you know we are just kind of following trends and we just want this that and that need of you know fulfilling our or having instant gratification just by buying things but we don't really think about why are we really buying it so mm-hmm. So yeah, I don't know how to better put it. Probably, do you have no, something to say? No, it goes back to the childhood thing, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, really, that's what just I'm being thinking. Being cautious what of what you've just said. I think, yeah, of ourselves and mm. of our uh, decisions in mm. life. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you sound like you have a very strong sense of your your values. So that's yeah. Uh, I think, and I think values are a great way of uh, of of managing uncertainty. Because it clarifies what it is you mm. you want to be doing, what direction you should take. If you have a tough decision, you can you can make uh, two things that might seem like they're difficult decisions or equal from a values perspective. Maybe one is mm. you know, much better than the other. So yeah, that's yeah. that's excellent. We've mm. covered a lot of ground here. Yeah. Uh, was there anything <laughs> yeah. that you wanted to mention or cover, or talk about that we didn't get a chance to do yet? Oh, Not, um, I can think of now. Well, I think I'm taking a big risk in August with um, well, oh, uh, yeah, with you're, the you're Kyrgyzstan. Doing, you're doing uh, the Silk, Silk Road Silk, Mountain. You know, race. I was yeah. looking at this um, uh, race. Yeah. The it's well, it's a, I don't know if it's a, you can explain to my listeners what what exactly it is, but that's no joke. That that's a uh, sixteen thousand something kilometers yeah. 16, and uh, twenty six hundred twenty six thousand meters, meters of climbing over fourteen days. So that's not. That's nothing to sneeze at. So, uh, yeah. can you explain what it is? You're, what it is? This thing and why you're doing it? Um, I think I, I I like to keep on challenging myself, and I believe in the the power of you know a person's uh, ability is not limited by just um, their physical ability, and I think um, the mind plays a very significant role in. Um, you know what you are able to achieve so I think um, just the mindset of taking that big step or being able to I think just look at the numbers and then so this is the Silk Road mountain race in in Kyrgyzstan Kyrgyzstan. yeah Silk Road mountain race in Kyrgyzstan in August Mm -hmm. this is actually the second edition Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. so but I think it was that first of all challenging my mindset and being in an uncomfortable position Uh, two it was I think just a brilliant adventure to be part of. And um, I wasn't expecting that I was um, actually going to get in, but they had like a very rigorous, mm. like like it took me an hour just to fill out a form, mm-hmm. you know, answering a lot of questions based on the manual that they put out. <clears throat> the People go out to cycle in Kyrgyzstan uh, as a tour, um, cycle touring. But the fact that it's, it's like, there's a time constraint, right? Mm-hmm. It's, in less than 14 days yeah. so that's 130 kilometers every day uh, on average yeah. no, the least that you have to do is 130 well plus the climbing that's plus the uh, climbing yeah. yep and then supporting yourself yeah. it's, it's yeah. unsupported um, I was really inspired by the transcontinental race mm-hmm. um, so uh, you know when I found out they were doing it when they started out uh, I was like yeah I want to do that because that's so incredible Um I never really took. I don't know why I never entered into that, but this just seemed so much more incredible and out there that um, has like one day I just saw an ad. It literally was an ad, and I was like, <laughs> "My God, this is just so mm-hmm. incredible! I I need to do this." Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, it's 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 that. I just have to do it. Um, it's like a challenge for yourself. 
yeah. yeah. But there, there was something inside of me that was saying, mm. just you know, just let's try it. Um, yeah. So um, going forward from here, I think um, I, I've I've been planning my route. I've been planning, you know, how I should. Um, where should I sleep? You know, how many kilometers should I do every day? Are there day? a lot of uh, places? Are you going to be sleeping outside? A yeah, lot? so either Bivy or a, like a or a, in the yurt. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have it at a, at a reach, like a checkpoint, but okay. not necessarily you know sleeping in that. Um, depending on where I stop, mm-hmm. or if it's a checkpoint that I just stop and then go. So it's it's. I mean, I'm just still deciding on mm-hmm. my own way of doing okay. it. I mean, there's, they've, mm-hmm. given, they've given a route, so mm-hmm. you, you have to follow it, a mm-hmm. route. It's unlike the transcontinental mm-hmm. where you can do you any route. have to yeah. go to those checkpoints, but you yeah. can do any way you want yeah. to do that. So, um, but it's 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 uh, finding where my abilities are like pushed to the maximum, but I can still maintain, uh, you know, cover a lot of ground. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've, I've come up with that. <laughs> let's mm-hmm. let's see what happens. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, that's fa- fabulous. It's a mountain race. It's not. Is it a like a mountain bike race, or is it road bikes, or touring bikes, or um, how, how, so they terrain? Uh, is it? They've given some guidance on mm-hmm. you know some mm-hmm. some uh, a mountain bike could work and a cyclocross bike could work. Cycle cyclocross. Um, adventure gravel bikes, those okay. those ones. Yeah. Um, people have said, like you know, on one of the Facebook groups, um, that uh, because of the comfort, they'll probably choose the mountain bike and yeah. still be able to do it in those days, because um, there's a lot of descents. So cyclocross might not be the best for descending, but um, so mountain bikes are good for that. But it's it's your it's up to you how how okay. you want to you know take on that challenge. So wow. I'm probably taking a cyclocross bike. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, best of luck. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, are there, uh, because on the transcontinental, I have a friend who did yeah. the transcontinental, oh, really? and we're, um, okay. uh, the, the, when you follow them, they've on got the a dot, the dot watcher. So can we wa- we'll follow yeah, your it's dot? Yeah, it's okay. the same uh, with okay. them. It's Excellent. the same company. Yeah, the dots. Yeah, cool. The dot. yeah. All right. Uh, anything else that we. Um, um, I think Anything, you know, just closing statements. I don't know if well, there's I, anything. I, I'll yeah. give you an opportunity to just yeah. um, you know, uh, plug away if people are okay. interested in um, Lemon Doves or the yeah. Tri Pakistan. Yeah. How can they find you guys? Where can they learn mm. more? Yeah. Right. Should we say? Go yeah, for it. Yeah. Do you want to do Tri Pakistan or Lemon Doves first? Um, well, you can, well for Tri Pakistan, um, we're all over social media right now. On Instagram, it's just Tri Pakistan, T R I P A K I S T A N, and we're on Facebook as well by Tri Pakistan and um, for sorry website. and the website, <laughs> the most important thing. <laughs> it's www.tripakistan.com. Mm-hmm. And for Lemon Doves, it's, again, the website is lemondoves.co.uk. Um, and we're on social media, um, on Facebook and Instagram as Lemon Doves as well. Okay. But we are sort of, you know, getting into more promoting ourselves on social media um, for Lemon Doves. Because at the minute, we're not that active, but we're okay. establishing. Um, there's a holding site at the minute for Lemon Doves where we would love if people, you know, just sign up because we would want to inform people once our first product is launched. So that's one uh, important piece of information. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Yeah. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was this really was good fun. for us. This is well. a good experience. <laughs> Thank yeah. you very much, and uh, wish you the best of luck with with all of. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah, for having us here. Thank you, bud. I hope you all enjoyed that. And if this has piqued your interest, check out Try Pakistan on the 21st of July, or anything else that you've heard today. Links are in the show notes as usual. And if you enjoy all things risk, a great free and easy way you can support us is to leave a positive review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. It really helps us out by boosting our ranking and making the show discoverable by others. That is it for now. Until next time. And as always, don't forget, risk is life.